we have Jack Neely here. He's a lifelong journalist and longtime newspaper columnist who has written about a dozen books about Knoxville, including the Tennessee Theater, Grand Entertainment Palace, The Old City, Short History, the award-winning Historic Knoxville, The Curious Visitor's Guide, uh, which was published by the Knoxville History Project, um, uh, an educational nonprofit, of which he is executive director. He's a UT History Department Distinguished Alumnus Honoree. He has recently earned an honorary doctorate from Maryville College and a commendation from the East Tennessee Historical Society. Uh, Neely had written about all parts of Knoxville. The Bearden book is especially close to his heart as he grew up in and around Bearden, seeing movies as, as its old drive-in, uh, mowing many of its lawns, delivering papers on a Bearden paper route by bicycle, and grilling cheeseburgers as a late shift fry cook at the old Bearden Shoney's. Still, most of what went into the new book is information he's, he's learned in preparing it with his colleague, uh, Paul James, and much of it took him by surprise. So I hope it'll take you by surprise as well, some of these details that you may recognize or may learn about. Um, so if you will, join me in welcoming Jack Neely. All right. All right, thanks a lot, Davis. Pre appreciate, uh, appreciate that. I, and I wanna thank my favorite bookstore, Union Ave, uh, for, for, uh, for featuring, featuring us. Uh, uh, it's always fun to do, to do events with you all. Um, it's, uh, by the way, uh, one of the big surprises in the book, I think uh, that will, that will uh, astonish some people, is that a, uh, a well-known, nationally well-known novel that I'm sure you all have on your shelves uh, at uh, Union Ave uh, was written in Bearden, kind of quietly, uh, about 40 years ago. Uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, I'll save that for, uh, for later. But I also want to thank uh, my colleague, Paul James, who's here with us. Uh, he uh, did, uh, I, I gave him, I wanted to give him equal credit on the book. He did uh, a lot of the, uh, there are a whole lot of pictures in the book. There are probably over 200 pictures uh, in the book. And uh, many of them are photographs taken by Paul. And a lot of the, uh, most of the photo research was done uh, by him. It was a really extensive historical photo research uh, that went into uh, making this book happen. He also did uh, some of the some of the research into the narrative. He kept reminding me of things we needed to we needed to uh, connect with. Um, I, I think he did some you know, some groundbreaking uh, work on the history of the bombs uh, florist uh, uh, facility, which was a, m a much much bigger deal than I realized. Um, and uh, and into the brickyard, some other parts of of Bearden history, and and was constantly questioning my assumptions. Was it's always good to have someone um, someone. Uh, uh, pointing things out and i think he he's the one that found out exactly where the uh, train station was which was uh, kind of a mystery to me even for, in childhood something i always worried about wondered about but um when i first uh, when we first founded uh, the Knoxville history project uh, five years and change ago um I, I, several people came to me and said uh, why don't you do a book about bearden this is one part of town that's never had a book just about its history uh, there have been books about Fountain City and Park City and other parts of town, uh, but never even in, in spite of the kind of the conspicuous nature of Bearden being kind of the old uh, historic West Knoxville, um, it's never had a book about it. And, uh, and, it, and, it's, uh, and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, it has quite a story to tell, as I think we prove with this book. Uh, but then after we began researching it, um, people started asking, after we really uh, kind of committed to it, uh, other people started saying, why are you doing a book about Bearden? It's just a bunch of strip malls and, and, and subdivisions. Um, and, uh, and it does have a few of those things, but it's, um, uh, it, it's, and it's old downtown is mostly gone. So it doesn't seem like a historic place to people anymore. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting. We have some few old downtowns around Knoxville, but not uh, Bearden's is, is almost completely, completely gone. Um, but uh, but but people who uh, who uh, you know people who just drive by may not think that it has a lot going on historically, but uh, there is a lot of reason to think about uh, it that way. And uh, I think the value of the book is partly about that it's a, a story of an American community in in some ways. It connects to American history in many different ways, from from the from the railroad era to the Civil War and the, and the, to up to World War II. It appeared to play a role in that and suburbanization and and everything else. Um, but, uh, but it's not likely, it's not exactly like any other, it, it's emblematic of America in many ways, but it's not exactly like any other suburb I know of in America. Uh, so it, I think we bring this out. 
Uh, first of all, uh, and the question that people asked me when we began, and I think that people still ask today, I did a radio thing the other day, and this guy, I think he was, uh, was, was, was expecting a, a, an argument. Uh, how do we define Bearden? Uh, and you might find that some people say Bearden ends here or ends there. Uh, to people of a certain age, uh, remember Bearden between 1917 and 1962, when there was a hard stop uh, on Kingston Pike that's not obvious anymore. And that hard stop was city limits. And if you live, it was along Carr Street or the kind of the, the eastern part of Harburg Drive. And uh, if you lived on the west uh, side of that of that uh, of that longitudinal uh, line. Uh, you went to Bearden School, therefore you lived in Bearden. Uh, if you lived on the east side, you lived in Knoxville, which was considered a different place. Um, and, it, and it was until, until incorporation in 1962. Uh, but we found out in research that, um, that Bearden, which was never incorporated, uh, was a more amorphous concept and sometimes stretched way over to Third Creek, although I think probably the best description of, of Bearden uh, uh, that I've heard is the area that's drained by Fourth Creek, which is the is the sometimes lovely creek that runs down alongside the uh, northern part of uh, of North Shore Drive. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, we learned quickly, um, and this is the case with a lot of Knoxville history, that Bearden is not really just one story. It's not like Houston, which is about the oil business. You know, it, it's about it's a it's a collision of a lot of different factors. Uh, and uh, some of them completely unrelated to each other, but several of them connected to the railroad uh, that came together and made uh, Bearden what it is. And, and they all have individual stories that sometimes intersect, but sometimes don't. Uh, so we tried to bring in all these things together. Uh, the uh, one of the uh, 200 years ago, there was something it wasn't, wasn't called Bearden; it was called Aaron, but it was a, it was a it was an area that was kind of discernible, kind of on the the. Uh, eastern uh, foot of Bearden Hill that uh, was uh, an accumulation of mills along Fourth Creek and an, uh, several uh, taverns along Kingston Pike, which was already there. Uh, the story of the, of the tavern run by the Hudeberg family is especially interesting, I think, um, it, 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 literally 200 years ago, kind of a well-known tavern that was, uh, there was a place that, uh, that you, could, you could have a, get a good night's sleep and also a, a, something to drink as well. But it was, uh, uh, that was what Bearden was for a long time when it was Air Aaron. It was a lot of early settlers uh, from all over the place. They're, a lot of them were from Ireland and that's how it got its name, Aaron. But uh, some were from Scotland, some were from, uh, from Germany, some were from other places. And they all just kind of, uh, kind of came together there on this kind of Western side of Knoxville. This wasn't, it was, like I say, it was out in the country. It was just a, 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 the first cluster of things when he came west of, of the city of Knoxville. Um, but, uh, but then in 1855 was another major, a major turning point when the arrival of the railroad, the East Tennessee and Georgia Railroad came through in 1855. And this uh, changed Bearden forever, changed Knoxville forever. I, I, I kid, and it's true, but Bearden had train service about 10 minutes before Knoxville did because the train, the first train ever seen in East Tennessee was on its way to Knoxville and, and stopped in Bearden and took on uh, some passengers and, and some stowaways, I, I, I understand. But um, anyway, it was, uh, that was a big deal and it made Bearden start, uh, it, pe people in industry started look at, at looking at Bearden as a, as a possible place to put factories. Um, then uh, then uh, in 1885, there was a big, uh, a, a big event uh, with many years in the making. And that was the establishment of a mental hospital. And now we don't, may not think of that as, as big a deal as it was in 1885, but this was a very, uh, it was a new idea that you could have hospitals just for mental patients. Uh, and that's, that's not only people with, uh, with uh, psychological disorders, but people with head injuries uh, would, would, go to, uh, would go to a hospital. And what prompted this? Something you, I'm sure you've heard of, the, the, the Civil War. Um, there, a lot of men came home from the Civil War. We hear about the, you know, the death tolls, but, but a lot of men came home from the war with, with head injuries. Uh, it's amazing what people survive sometimes, but they came home with head injuries and they come home with something we would today call PTSD. But it would, you know, of course, that term wasn't coined then, but a lot of these people had serious emotional problems after the war and they needed a place to treat them. And uh, this was considered a very progressive thing in 1885. 
Uh, it actually had been in the works since soon after the war and it even gotten national attention. Dorothea Dix up in Massachusetts had, uh, had expressed interest in, in being sure there's a, a mental health hospital in East Tennessee and, uh, and that it should be in Knoxville. And this was the second mental health hospital ever established in the state of Tennessee. There was one in Nashville before that, but not, not that long before. So that was a very big deal. Uh, and you know where that was? That's the area that we know as Lakeshore Park uh, today. Um, uh, later on, I mentioned uh, the railroad suggested the, pro the prospect of industry in, in, uh, in, in the Aaron area and later Bearden area. And uh, uh, in, in 1903, one of the biggest industries to settle there was uh, a brickyard uh, established by a guy named Alex Scott, who is a well-known industrialist in town. Uh, later on, was, had other, he had other brickyards in other parts of the community. But uh, one of the biggest ones that, that he established was in Bearden in, in 1903. It was there for at least 20 years um, and, uh, and kind of spawned a, a, a community of people who worked at the Brickyard and, and the community itself became known as, as Brickyard, the Brickyard community. Um, uh, then later on, a, a Cherokee Country Club. I mean, you have this industry going on down there. You have people making bricks in the Brickyard. And, uh, and then you've got uh, just above it on, on, a, on a slope, uh, a, a, the ridge above it, a, 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 an 18-hole golf course, the first 18-hole golf course in, in Knoxville history. And, and it has some surprisingly public uh, uh, roles in its early days. It was a place where some people landed planes, uh, airplanes, when they were, for example, scouting the first air, air mail routes through Knoxville. They landed at uh, Cherokee Country Club's golf course. Uh, they had, uh, you know, plays there uh, in, in around 1915 they were having the play in midsummer nice dream and people would drive the streetcar out to watch it at, on the golf course and they had some major golf tournaments there as well um, with bobby jones i think one of his big early triumphs was at cherokee country club's golf course so that's part of the story as well um, meanwhile kids in the brickyard the black kids who lived in the brickyard were walking across the, the golf course to go to school up at lions view school which was up on Right on Lions View, a lot of one of the big surprises to me, even having studied Knoxville for 30 years, was that before 1910, most of the people on Lions View Drive or Lions View Pike, as it was called then, it was just a dirt road at that time, were African Americans. Uh, that they they're African American farmers who had small farms along the that that beautiful bluff there, and uh, that was uh, that was their community, and and they never completely left. There's still a, a Lions View community uh, today, and I, I hope. That, that is very proud of itself. Um, but, um, and there, we try to tell their story in there as well. Uh, later on, a, a big change, a big, uh, Kingston Pike was mainly a, a way to get to Kingston and, and beyond to uh, points west to Nashville and so forth. Um, but, uh, and, and of course, most people went by, by a lot of these routes by train. But, uh, but it became much more popular in 1915. For what reason? It was something new called the Dixie Highway which connected the upper Midwest, uh, Michigan, upper Ohio, uh, Chicago, to Florida. And they all, uh, there were two, it had two major routes, but one came through Knoxville and, uh, and went, uh, even though Kingston Pike is east and west, it went 20 miles out of its way uh, to go back south again when he got uh, uh, to Dixie Lee Junction, as we know it today. Um, but uh, the 20 miles of Kingston Pike was part of the Dixie Highway and, and then a part of the Lee Highway, which went from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans and to points farther west, even to Los Angeles eventually. Um, so the, the Dixie and Lee Highways both kind of came together and bam, we suddenly have all these hundreds of tourists, every, every day tourists from all over the country driving through town, driving through Knoxville, but, but many of them preferring not to deal with the traffic of downtown and, and an expensive hotel on Gay Street they drive to Bearden and, and, uh, and spend the night at a motor court um, with, in, in Bearden. Uh, and there were, that was a whole new industry. It was kind of like a motel, but it was a place where you, it was cheaper. You could go in and just, you know, some people just camp in the grass. Some people had little cabins they could sleep in. But this became a major part of Bearden's economy in the uh, 19, by the 1920s, there were several motor courts in, uh, in, in Bearden. And we try to tell that whole story. They all kind of evolved into motels over the years. It, it's amazing to think that there were 13 motels in the area that we know as Bearden today, just on Kingston Pike um, at, at one time. Um, but uh, then in 1921, something that a whole lot of people, even people who grew up in Knoxville had never heard, that in 1921, uh, we had an airfield, the first big public airfield in Knoxville was 
in Bearden, this area called Bearden Field, which is the area just, it, it was the area just, uh, just east of the uh, of Forest Park Boulevard, stretching all the way over to where, where West High School is. That was a flat, an unusual flat area for Knoxville. Uh, and uh, that was a place where our first airport was. And for uh, at least 16 years, and it be, 1929 became McGee Tyson Airport, but for 16 years, that was the main airfield for the city of, of Knoxville. Um, but that, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, that, that is, a, is a whole story of Bearden's history that, that, uh, that, uh, that we, we tried to tell as much as we can. And, and I had heard, I'd certainly heard of the airport being there, but I did not know how much, uh, how many uh, like stunt attractions there were there. There were, there were lots of barnstormers who would come to Knoxville, well-known aviators who would come here and were known for different kinds of stunts or different kinds of planes. And, uh, and they came there and did big air shows at, uh, right at that, at that airfield. And people would just jam Kingston Pike uh, in, their, in their Model Ts and, and, uh, and to, to see these, these amazing shows. There were, unfortunately, at least one fatal accident there as well and and but some kind of funnier stories connected to that uh also but of course uh, by the 1920s uh, bearden saw the beginning of uh, something uh, we came to know as suburbanization we think of suburbanization as uh, kind of a post-war uh, uh, phenomenon but it really began here in the 20s in a big way and we talk about the early developers who developed places like sequoia hills and westmoreland and uh and the, and the neighborhoods along western sutherland avenue uh and that uh and we were lucky that all, all those places developed in, in, in terms of uh, suburban, suburbanizing because the original part of Bearden, a lot of which had developed mainly to, to uh, address the tourist traffic, uh, all these, these stores there, you know, the, the tourist traffic didn't, didn't, uh, didn't last. By the 1960s, we had something called I-40 that came through. And uh, in all the, the motels and things like that, there wasn't any use for them to be over on Kingston Pike anymore. So but there were still shops and some of these shops moved into the hotel buildings and, and they, they were able to keep uh, catering to the suburban customers who had moved out there after the, uh, the uh, Dixie Highway had, had, had come through town. Um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, then in 1970, we have kind of a, an interesting turning point when uh, I think Bearden, which had always been kind of a modest uh, sort of a place beforehand, began to, uh, to uh, uh, put on nicer clothes and, and got a bit fancier on us. And, and I, I talk about a few turning points. Uh, one was uh, the opening of uh, Nossel's first Mercedes dealership right in Bearden. And uh, the other was when a very famous actress uh, got out of her car. We'll, we'll save, uh, if you haven't heard that story, um, uh, we'll, we'll save that for our, our picture section. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, it, it seemed like something changed almost suddenly, like in 1970, 71, there's 1971 is when the Orangery opened. Uh, I think the, one of the first really ranked restaurants in Knoxville uh, opened it right in the middle of Bearden. Bearden became a kind of, seemed to be an important thing for, for, that, uh, for all that. But uh, like I say, I, I grew up in Bearden, as, as, as David, I, in, in and around Bearden, and uh, I, I thought I knew the place very well, but I had, uh, there were quite a few surprises I ran across. One, as I mentioned, was the extent of the African-American community on Lyons View. And it was just one of three uh, African-American communities in the Bearden area. Uh, there was the Lyons View community, there was the, the Brickyard, which was down at the bottom of the hill where Humber Place is now. And there was something else called Slady, which was over near um, uh, Sutherland Avenue. And, uh, and all these had their different personalities their different attributes. Um, but we try to tell all those stories. There's a, a, a pretty harrowing story about uh, a, a a supply pastor for a, a, a Presbyterian church in, in the brickyard and who spent a, a couple of, 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 of scary summers there in the 1930s and, and described it in, in some detail. Um, but uh, uh, there was, a, a, it was, it was a, one of the uh, darker moments in Bearden history perhaps, but, uh, uh, but it was, all these stories, I think, need to be to be told, um, and and are all part of the tapestry of this complicated and, and really pretty fascinating place. Um, but uh, but there uh, another other surprises the uh, uh, the I'd, I'd heard of the Wayside Inn, which was where a lot of people remember Naples uh, restaurant fondly. And before Naples was Alberti's, I went to Alberti's as a kid. But before Alberti's, it was called the Wayside Inn, 
and I was really surprised to find out what the Wayside Inn was. I'd seen pictures of it as it was in the 20s. It was a, it was a, a place for uh, travelers to, to stop and get a hamburger. But at night, it turned into a nightclub in the 1920s and 30s. And it was a, uh, it, they had, uh, sometimes literally all night, they had jazz bands playing there. And, uh, and Knoxville people would go there and travelers who were staying at motor courts within walking distance would go there. Uh, and it was, it, it sounded like a, just a, a fascinating little chapter in, in Knoxville's jazz history that I, I had never even, uh, even thought about. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it, it, and it brings up the fact that Bearden was a couple of things. It was convenient to tourists, of course, who were driving down Kingston Pike on the, uh, on the Dixie Lee Highway. But it was also just outside city limits. So people in Knoxville could get away with stuff in Bearden that they couldn't get away with in the city uh, when, the, when, the, when the city was, didn't have stricter laws than, than Bearden did, but it was much better policed. So if you wanted, uh, if, if you wanted to, uh, to, to drink some liquor, you were probably less likely to be caught doing that during Prohibition in Bearden than you would be in, in Knoxville. So uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was an interesting uh, uh, little, little part of, of, of the Bearden story. Uh, another big surprise was the extent, as, as, uh, as, as Paul uh, pointed out, uh, of the Balms Florist, really a plantation, a giant factory of roses. They had, had you know, produced millions of roses a year in this giant uh, area. Now, now where Balm, Balm Drive is, a lot, of, a lot of people know where Balm Drive is, but you might not think that that's, was the old uh, producer of so many roses for the for the you know, not just for the local market but for the southeastern market uh, is one of the biggest rose uh, producers in America at the time I think. But um, other um, all sorts of stories about uh, uh, just serendipitous little things about uh, who would have got, thought that uh, those people who remember the Highland Grill uh, that uh, the, the famous Broadway actress Tallulah Bankhead would show up there late one night in 1938 or nine and uh and not only show up there but but uh but make make, make some trouble with some ball ball fans that story is in the is in the book um but uh, but also the story of the first integrated rock band uh, the fabulous five were a white band at bearden who met this uh young singer who had grown up in the in the brickyard area in hamburg place a uh, young singer named Clifford Curry, who, who uh, as a teenager already had uh, some credits uh, to, to his name. He'd uh, written some songs that had gotten, had to even watch the, these white football teams play at Bearden uh, uh, football field and, uh, and met these, this rock band called the Fabulous Five, popular rock band, and, and added something to them that they didn't have before and uh, kind of an R&B feel and they, they actually made some recordings. I, I never knew this. It's uh, uh, and you can actually hear some of these recordings on online and they're really good. Um, I'm, I kind of wish they had gone kept it going but they mainly just played at local local uh, uh, fraternities and country club gigs and things like that uh, all these years. Uh, but yeah you know, industries Bowman Hats our main hat company was in in the Knoxville area it was in Beard and, uh, and, uh, and that's why Hamburg place has its name today but also Cherokee porcelain. They didn't make uh, teacups for your grandmother's tea parties, but they, they made uh, very durable and beautiful signs uh, for, for lots of purposes. And surprisingly, even the New York subway system is supplied with, uh, with Cherokee porcelain signs. But we came up with so many different odd little creative stories that we have a whole chapter called uh, Beard and Bohemia. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, brings together a lot of, uh, of creative people who are kind of working almost independently of, of, of Bearden or anything else, but they, they lived here and added something, I think, to the, to the place while they were here. Uh, we have, uh, it was it's pretty surprising that I saw, saw Ken Burns' series about country music. You, you know how legendary the Carter family is, uh, Mother Maybell and, and then the next generation, June Carter. Well, the Carter family, including Mother Maybell and June Carter and her sisters, uh, actually performed uh, to open an SO station, a gas station on in Bearden, right in the middle of Bearden in 1948 uh, for, a, for a radio gig. Uh, anyway, that, it's, uh, uh, we have that story in there. Um, we have the story of Don Gibson's tragic life. Don Gibson, I think the only uh, country music star who came from, uh, who started out in this area 
uh, was a was a star in Knoxville. Most of them went to Nashville as soon as they became really famous. Don Gibson chose to stay in Knoxville, and I'm not sure it was a good a good choice for him or not. But uh, but he was uh, he lived. Uh, in West Hills and then in Sequoia Hills and then West Hills again and, and had, uh, had, uh, had uh, in some ways even I think people who didn't like Don Kitson would have to admit that he had a, he had a, 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 pretty, a, a pretty tragic life and these, these were not, even though he was here for 15 years or so, we're not, and, and even though he was extremely famous professionally, they're, they're the, best, the best years that, that any, uh, any, any musician can imagine having. When you're writing songs like "I Can't Stop Loving You" and Ray Charles has a big hit with it, and uh, and Patsy Klein has a big hit with your song "Sweet Dreams," uh, but his whole personal life was falling apart, and it just seemed to keep falling apart and falling apart again. And uh, in, in all in all, he was living in this in this area. Um, but uh, but all uh, the the stories of I, I remember going to Buddy's Barbecue in the late '70s, uh, and there was there's a lot of bluegrass there. I thought, well, this, this is funny, it's just free bluegrass, uh, and I I wasn't that big a fan at the time. But but I did not realize that some of the people I was listening to, uh, like there was one teenager playing mandolin there whose name was Ricky Skaggs, uh, who later became a major major star, probably the most famous mandolinist mandolinist in the world now. But uh, but he he was just uh, kind of trying things out at, at Buddy's Barbecue, uh, just a little little barbecue in Bearden uh, right there, and uh, that's that's something that deserves remembering. And at the same time, and I, I alluded earlier to a uh, to a book uh, that uh, you can I'm sure you can get at uh, at Union Ave. It's one of Cormac McCarthy's best known books, and it's called Blood Meridian. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's, it's his most violent book. It's about it's about Texas, but uh it's about you know the wild west basically but uh but it is uh, uh, it was written uh while he was he was living very quietly at uh, at a motel the colony motel right in the middle of hamburg place and uh right when the, the orangery was there and, and all these things and he was and, and he was popping in at draper how many people remember draper books it was right the bookstore the coolest bookstore before before uh, uh union ave and carpe libram was draper books uh, and it was uh, it was it was in a in a in a, in a house uh, building in, in the middle of Harbor Place. And but Cormac McCarthy, I think I, I talked to the owner, and she said he he tended to go there when he thought nobody else else was going to be there, and and he tended to find those times, and uh, he just preferred to be there alone with with the uh, proprietor and and the and the and the bookstore dog that he was especially fond of. Um, but he'd go back to his little motel room and and keep banging away on on this uh, on this book that would be shocking to to the nation in, in many ways in years to come. But uh, anyway, those are just a a, a few tastes of uh, of the uh, of, of the book and kind of the I want to give you kind of a structure of of the history of Bearden. There are a lot of little offshoots of these things, but those are kind of the big turning points in the ways that Bearden connects with Knoxville history and also with American history in, in many ways. And I think we're ready to show some uh, some slides if, if y'all would like to I see. can sneak in a couple questions too before you go to the yeah. slide. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. So we've got one, you were talking about the airfield and we have someone that's asked a question and then someone gave an answer so you can add to it. Uh, Patricia asked, did Lindbergh make a stop here as he was barnstorming the nation to promote the development of civilian aviation? And Harry says, uh, someone on the call said, named Harry said, yes, my 97 year old father recalls seeing him there as a child. So you got anything I, to add to? I have to say that I would, I, I hope, I hope he did. It's not in the book because I've, I've heard two or three people claim that they're that their uh, that their ancestors remembered seeing Lindbergh, and I have gone through newspapers.com. I've, I've scraped every way I can think, and I, I cannot find any evidence that Lindbergh was ever in the Knoxville area. He was in. He was intended to be. He was invited to come. Uh, they at one time were expecting him, but he went to Chattanooga instead, uh, which I think uh, uh, made some people angry. But uh, but it was. Uh, uh, I, if you have any kind of evidence, and we we put this out there, I put this out on the radio. I said, if you have any evidence that that Lindbergh was in Knoxville, please do let me know. Some other people, uh, Jimmy Doolittle, uh, was a very famous flyer uh, at, at one time. I think he was more famous than Lindbergh. Was here, and he was a big star, and and came here and did some did some loops. Jim, the same Jimmy Doolittle was famous famous for bombing Tokyo uh, in 1942. But um, but uh, th this was. Uh, uh, but Lindbergh, I, I, I've, I've looked and looked and looked and not found any, any, uh, any, 
any uh, any evidence of it. And in fact, I found some people in that time say it's too bad that Lindbergh's never been here. Um, so unless it was like later in his life or something, I, I don't, I, I, I just haven't found that. But uh, Another question that we had come in from uh, Carol Mayo, Mayo Jenkins, where she says, thank you yeah. for this book. Hey, Carol. And the, and the webcast, uh, my aunt and uncle, uh, Janie and Tom Dean, lived in a beautiful house called The Deanery that later became the Dean Hill Country Club. Do you have uh, right. information or pictures of that? Yes. In fact, that's kind of the, I guess, the Western limits of what we considered beard. And we probably wouldn't have bothered unless it was about, uh, about that interesting story of, of the Deans and Dean Hill Country Club, which was uh, Jack Homer's uh, project out there. Uh, but yeah, and I remember personally that that beautiful house up there as a as a kid. I was there a lot. That was that, that was the place where everybody wanted to be sophisticated. I think was up at the at the at the deanery. Um, but uh, but yeah, some famous stories about the uh, the Dorsey brothers reuniting there uh, after many years uh, as uh, as uh, estranged, I would say. Um, and um, uh, there, you know, they had they had uh, lots of dances and and jazz bands would 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 play up there. And but of course, kids like me remember it best for the, the wonderful swimming pool uh, that was down the hill from there. But uh, yeah, we have that a, a bit of that story, and also the story of Jack Comer's uh, radio, uh, record studio, which is something I didn't know as much about. Uh, I'd heard of, but Valley Records. It was in the nineteen. 50s and 60s, and uh, Archie Campbell made some of his first recordings there, um, a comedian and, and singer at the time. Um, but uh, but uh, some like uh, uh, Crying in the Chapel, which Elvis Presley had later recovered, recorded, was first recorded uh, right at Dean Hill Country Club um, in the 1950s by the uh, son of the, of the guy that wrote it. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 several paragraphs at least about, the, about Dean Hill in there. And I'm sorry, a lot of the Dean Hill is gone now. It's been developed away. It used to be, it's, it's a, bit, a bit of a hill still there, but not nearly what it used to be. We have a couple of questions about locations, but do you want to go on to the, to the I'm, slide? I'm, I'm easy if, uh, if, if, uh, if, if they're... Uh, Harry asked about where the, where the railroad station was located. Yeah, okay, that, that's a good question because I, I uh, really uh, wonder about that since my early youth, and I, I think we've tri triangulated, and then we actually found some evidence of it. It was, uh, you know where the trestle goes across uh, North Shore? It was on the western side of that trestle, not very far away from the current road, and there's still a concrete ramp that apparently was used to load stuff, probably built in the latter years of the train station, that's still there. Uh, the train station has been gone since uh, at least probably the early 40s, um, but it's uh, that that's exactly where it was, and you can kind of tell where it was. It was uh, it connected to what was then uh, kind of a, a part of, of uh, Weisgarber, but there's not a road there anymore. Um, but it's right behind the the pool company is is actually which is right in front of it, and and it's kind of a parking area now. And there's been another question, Anne asked about who's the owner, of, who was, do you know the owner of the Esso station? And there's a follow up that the reason I ask is the Esso station is that my grandfather, R.N. Writings, owned a gas station on Kingston Pike in Bearden. I don't remember. I remember the name Dender, D E N D E R. Uh, I'd have to look that up. I, and I, I can't say um, for sure about that, but, uh, but I think they sometimes called it Dender's Esso. It was at the corner of Kingston Pike and, uh, and Forest. Park Boulevard. It's now a smoothie place or something like that. All right. That's all I have for now. So okay, yeah, we're ready for ready for slides. All right. This this is a, a wonderful picture taken by our our friend Sean Pointer. A lot of people wouldn't even recognize this picture as Bearden, but this was taken on top of Bearden Hill, uh, up near the old house, the Reynolds house up there, looking south, of course, because you can see the mountains uh, and the river. Um, but in the distance, uh, you see the uh, 1885, the original uh, uh, Eastern State Mental, they call it the asylum back then. Um, that's the uh, central building to a, what was originally a much larger uh, uh, kind of complex of buildings there even in the earliest days. 
Um, but you see that, and then on the right, of course, you see uh, the, the relatively recent Sacred Heart Cathedral. So you see a, a 140 years of architecture in that one, in that one, uh, in that one picture. Um, but that's uh, that's just a that that to me that was a, a an amazing kind of uh, picture that kind of makes your head turn, uh, and to think that that's uh, that's real. Most of that area is is what people consider Bearden, kind of along the Fourth Creek uh, Fourth Creek Valley. All right, next one. All right, here's here's uh, that's the cover of the book. Uh, here's an early historic map, um, uh, Civil War era map that. Uh, that shows Aaron, um, and that before it was called Bearden, you see the uh, the the yeah exactly um, the river coming by, right by there. But Aaron was the first stop uh, west of Knoxville, and it's interesting that if you were catching a, a train at the Southern Station in Knoxville, the first stop was was Aaron or later Bearden. It was five miles from Knoxville, and there was, it was another five miles to uh, to uh, uh, what was the next one. But but 15 miles to Concord um, was the was the uh, was the next station after that, but uh, but it's it's uh, interesting to think that that uh, that was a place that you would get on a train that was bound uh, out of state uh, just to to take what was kind of like a uh, a subway ride within within uh, within the community of, of kind of Greater Knoxville, but. Uh, by the way, they called it the Holston River. That's uh, that's always surprising to people. Um, uh, the Tennessee River in Knoxville was called the Holston until the 1870s, roughly. And uh, it, it, they, for many years, people had said uh, it made, makes more sense to think of it as part of the Tennessee. Uh, so they finally started calling it that, and, and had some apparently some. It made some uh, uh, river improvement projects in Nashville easier to, to talk about if they called the whole thing the, the, the Tennessee. All right, next one. All right, this is a, a lovely painting. Uh, uh, this may be the first real uh, uh, piece of fine art from Knoxville, and uh, I think you can make that argument at least. By an artist named James Cameron, um, uh, not the uh, not the Hollywood director, but uh, a much earlier James Cameron, who was uh, from Scotland, uh, and he was just in Knoxville for probably not very long, a few months or a year or so, uh, but was uh, was just looking for 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 views. And Lions View uh, was a famous view, and that's why it, the street is named Lions View because for where uh, the, the Lion family had their home. Uh, but you would people would come from downtown to to just stop and behold this beautiful view. You, you probably can't see this very well. Uh, it's all private property now uh, and lots of walls and houses and things up there, but you can see part of it to go down to Lakeshore uh, and I'm glad that that's open to public now and you can see over toward the right, uh, this, you see that, that island is still there. It looks a little bit different today, uh, not quite as big. But uh, but that was uh, that was a scene uh, that was that was painted uh, that inspired uh, uh, Mr. Cameron, uh, who moved on, uh, uh, was much traumatized by the civil, kind of a tragic story. Uh, uh, Frederick Moffat has written a book about James, Cam James Cameron, the UT art professor, and uh, it's a uh, it's uh, uh, a guy who I, I think ended up just uh, went, became a kind of um, uh, was much troubled by the Civil War, especially, and, and later became a Presbyterian minister, and I think uh, didn't do much painting later in his life. But, uh, all right, yeah, yeah, I mentioned uh, the East Tennessee Hospital for the Insane, that's that's what they called it, um, and opened in, in 1886. After about 15 years of struggle to uh, to get it going, there was a, it was a big, it was a battle in the state legislature about this, so, and it, it sometimes fell down a long Civil War lines uh, uh, with uh, some of the uh, uh, more conservative uh, confederate, former Confederates uh, opposed to it. Um, but they, uh, uh, the story is that it was, uh, uh, it was pushed through by, by uh, a legislator from Knoxville who had been uh, mayor and, uh, and, uh, and uh, sheriff of Knox County. Uh, Marcus de Lafayette Beard, and we have a picture of him coming up. But that's that building. Uh, a good sh part of that building is still standing on on uh, Lakeshore Park today, um, and uh, I'm glad that it is. I'm, I'm really uh, happy they they were able to save 
a, a good piece of it that's used for various purposes. We we in fact began our our, uh, our first our first research into the Bearden book almost three years ago. I think we had a big public uh, public meeting and uh, had a big turnout, staying room room only in a in a in a room inside the, inside that building um, that uh, that we were collecting some of the stories we 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 ended up putting in the book. All right, this is a, an interesting picture for a couple of things. It's a historic golf picture, and there aren't that many pictures of uh, historic golf pictures. You can see a caddy and some players uh, at Cherokee Country Club. But what's interesting, uh, more interesting about this picture is that in the background are two buildings that were significant but are not there anymore. Um, but although they were both later rebuilt and re represented by other buildings that are still there. Um, on the left is the Mount Pleasant uh, Baptist Church, which was an African-American church up on Lyons View. I mentioned that that was a, a, a traditionally Afri African-American community up there. And that was their original church uh, that was uh, went back, uh, I, I can't remember exactly when it was built, but it, right next to it is their graveyard, the little churchyard that uh, interestingly has some some uh, graves of, uh, of, of, of members of the colored the colored troops of the, of the uh, Civil War. Um, and uh, to the right is the Lions View School, which was an African American school, a public school for African Americans uh, that, that goes back uh, probably to the 1890s, way, way back back there. But this was a, a subject of a great many fundraisers. There, there would be congressmen, uh, especially Republican congressmen, back when that, the Republicans were felt that they were connected to the civil rights era, uh, would give talks at that school to try to raise money to, to keep it going. But that school was torn down in the 40, that school building was torn down in the 40s and, and the, uh, the uh, church uh, was replaced by another church that's not there today, a beautiful church that's there today. And the school was torn down and, and built with a, with a kind of a standard looking uh, brick uh, building in the 40s as well and kept operating as a, as a, as a school for, for black children of the area until, uh, until the end of segregation in the 1960s. I wanted to help uh, interject. Uh, Carol Mayo Jenkins had a comment and her uh, theater knowledge about Tennessee Williams, who in his play Settling Last Summer sets the story in an asylum called Lion's View. Um, You're right. So um, just wanted yeah. to bring that in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Tennessee Williams connections to Lion's View are are uh, are significant. Uh, the Lion's View area in general, because his um, in his memoirs he, he talked about his sister. Um, uh, Rose, whose who's, who's troubled life is the foundation for at least three of his plays, uh, but that she uh, first began showing signs of instability uh, when, uh, when during her kind of interminable series of, of, of debutante uh, parties uh, at Cherokee Country Club in the 20s. Uh, so, and I've heard stories about the Williams family having connections to uh, the mental institution as well. Um, that's it's interesting. In that, in that play, uh, the uh, Lions View Institution is presumed to be in Louisiana, uh, but obviously the, the, that's way too much of a coincidence to, 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 to not have a connection to the Lions View in the city of Knoxville that he knew pretty well. He never lived here, but his family, several members of his family did, and he knew, he visited here several times. He knew, he knew what Lions View was, and then in Knoxville, when people talk about going to the mental institution, they said, well, we need to send you to Lions View. That's what they would say. That was the kind of the short shorthand for the asylum. All right, this is the Lions View streetcar, which had a lot of stories about it. And partly, um, some of them might have been um, uh, based on people heading, heading to, and, to and from the asylum. But um, this was, uh, this was a, uh, an unusual streetcar in that it had rubber tires after 1930. Before that, it was a standard streetcar with a, they ran on tracks. But in 1930, they started this new thing. And this is probably from about 1930, uh, when it was kind of a new thing and they were kind of proud of it and they were taking pictures of it. It was like a streetcar in that it got its its power from overhead lines. And you can see those, those, you know, streetcar lines, they were electric connect, uh, connected to the to the streetcar uh, turbines. But but the uh, uh, it, but it had rubber tires and it had a, a it didn't have tracks so you could steer around obstacles, and anybody that's been to uh, that's taken the streetcar at uh, 
in New Orleans, a St. Charles streetcar knows that sometimes a car is in front of it. And as long as that car is there, the streetcar cannot move. Well, this streetcar could maneuver around uh, with, in, in, in some, with, in, with some limitations, move, maneuver around obstacles. And this was considered in the 1930s kind of the future of streetcars. Unfortunately, um, the uh, uh, streetcars died altogether in the 1940s. I think our last streetcar line was in 1947 or so. But there are stories about this streetcar, um, in, uh, including a story that's kind of like the Rosa Parks story from the 1920s. A woman refused to yield her seat. Uh, a black woman sat in, in, the, in the, one of the front seats of the streetcar and refused to budge. And, uh, and the driver tried to, tried to cajole her to, to move and, and, and actually, actually finally just had to pull over and the police got on and, and, and arrested her. But, uh, but the, uh, there are various um, uh, stories about whether the Lions View streetcar was, was segregated or less, you know, was less segregated than other, other cars. Uh, some of the people who live in the Lions View community say it was, it was more easygoing depending on who the driver was. And you could, you could, some drivers would let you sit anywhere if, uh, if he knew you. But um, anyway, it's a, it's a whole, uh, Lions View had, was a, on a streetcar line for about 40 years. It was part of the, the history. And it's, it's crazy to think of people driving, like riding a streetcar to go play golf, but they, they did that in, uh, in this era. All right, here's uh, back to the, uh, uh, the uh, brickyard community. Uh, I was talking about the African-American community. This is, the brickyard was once a place that had three churches, all, all uh, black churches, uh, and, uh, and, and a few dozen houses uh, of people who all lived down there and had, had this as their community. They were mostly on the south side of Kingston Pike, but a few on the north. Um, and the only thing that really has survived of this is the Wallace Chapel AME Zion Church down on Hamburg Drive which by the way was originally part of Kingston Pike. It's a very complicated story about how Kingston Pike has, has evolved over the years. But before 1924, this was part of Kingston Pike um, and uh, Homburg Drive was, and it connected with what we know as old Kingston Pike um, uh, on the other side of the train tracks. Um, but uh, anyway, this is, uh, like I say, the, the only uh, remnant and we have a, an interior picture of the, of the con part of the congregation in there as well. This is uh, from the 1950s and uh, a, a Christmas party at the uh, AME church. And on the left, the guy with the, with the clerical looking scarf uh, is, a, is a young singer at, at that church named Clifford Curry that I mentioned earlier. He later became a, an R&B uh, doo-wop kind of a singer in the 1950s and later still was a soul singer, had a, had a national hit uh, called uh, She Shot a Hole in My Soul in the mid 60s. But in, in between was, I mentioned earlier, was, uh, was in a rock and roll band uh, out, of, out of Bearden High. So he, he got around a good deal. He, he performed in Knoxville a lot in the 60s and uh, early 70s. Uh, later kind of made, made, his, uh, made his living out of Myrtle Beach, uh, doing a lot of, uh, a lot of that uh, kind of beach music from, uh, that was so popular for the, you know, the shag uh, dancing and all that down there. But um, had, a, had, a, have, had a pretty busy life as a musician. And uh, this is a picture from the airport, an early picture from the airfield. And uh, this is uh, 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 probably before it was actually McGee Tyson Airport. Uh, this is uh, Frank Andre, who was one of the earliest uh, uh, pilots and pilot uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, pilot train uh, guys who, who train people to fly planes. But and uh, and Walter Self, who was uh, a uh, and and. and uh, guy in, involved in, in mechanical industry stuff downtown who was very interested in running a, a, uh, a, an, an air organization uh, and starting an airfield in Knoxville, a public airfield. But that's them uh, uh, posing with an early, early monoplane there in the, in the 1928. But yeah, this is the year before it became uh, McGee Tyson Airport. And it was, it was McGee Tyson Airport for about eight years after that. Um, Okay, this is a picture of Dixie Highway in Bearden, uh, and this is uh, standing not too far um, from the Buddy's Barbecue, maybe a little bit to the to the east of there. And uh, you see, uh, I, I kind of flipped when I saw this picture because it's uh, it has several interesting things uh, about it. One is there's a little sign that directs you to the to the then new Highland Memorial Cemetery, and kind of over on the left. 
Um, and uh, on the right, uh, this is just as, as this is what people driving from Florida back to Chicago would see. Uh, but on the right is uh, the name of Curry on the mailbox. And that was uh, uh, Clifford Curry. I think his grandfather actually owned property right there. And uh, was uh, the Curry family were the probably the best, one of the most durable families, I'll say, and uh, best known to the white community uh, because they were right there on the pike for many, many years. Um, people, almost everybody that grew up in Bearden in the, in the 30s, 40s remembers the Curries. But, uh, all right, and this is not far from there. Uh, this is the Wayside Inn. And uh, we had to, uh, Paul and I actually had, to, I'd, I'd seen this picture before in the back of, uh, of Naples um, and uh, kind of in the back hallway there and remembered it. And Paul and I looked and looked and looked and could not find any other pictures. And I said, well, maybe it's still there. And we got in touch with, uh, with the, the owners of Capiello Real Estate and uh, they let us in to take a picture of, of their picture. And, but this is the Wayside Inn uh, as it looked uh, when it was a jazz hangout. I mentioned this is when it was like they had all night jazz shows and, and you, you, see it, it just advertises country ham and biscuits and honey and um, and uh, steak and chicken dinner and that sun, it sounds like a basic kind of a lunch or supper place. And it was, but after supper, it, uh, they, they cleared out all the, the tables and it became a dance, a dance, a dance hall. And even uh, some, some kind of semi well-known, not, not any major, major jazz bands, but some, some semi well-known traveling jazz, jazz bands played there. And I was surprised to find out that the original Tennessee chocolate drops, who were just a, a, a small, trio or sometimes a, a, a quartet, uh, including Howard Armstrong and Carl Martin, who are now kind of legendary in, in jazz, uh, jazz and blues. Uh, today had did a show there probably in about 1930, uh, summer of 1930, I believe. But it's, uh, it's something that, I mean, people would come from Knoxville, I say, I say to, 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 uh, to dance there, and they would sometimes serve breakfast in the morning to people who'd been who had been uh, dancing there all night and they would have, you know, liquor be flowing in there and they weren't bothered by the cops because this is outside of city limits back then. Um, so it was, a, it was a, a, a fascinating scene and something I, I would love to, to find out more about. And you can tell something about uh, the, uh, the clientele of people who went there. Uh, it was, it looks so like such a modest place, but in the newspapers, there are lots of uh, one ads for, uh, for missing jewelry, uh, like even platinum and gold jewelry at the Wayside Inn uh, that, that uh, somebody was dancing and came home and realized they didn't have their, their, their brooch or something. And uh, it was, uh, uh, so that's, there, there were fancy, uh, uh, fancy dressers at least who showed up there in the twenties. Uh, by the way, that, that building burned down in the, uh, in the mid forties and was replaced with the kind of streamlined stone building that you you see today or that that building was the way still the wayside when it opened and still had a little bit of music not quite like it had in the 20s and 30s but but still had some some live music uh, uh into the 50s and then became uh, uh the same built that that rebuilt building became alberti's and later naples but on the same site and you're looking down by the way to the left that's the original keyson pike going down uh what we now know as hamburg hamburg drive Next one, yeah. Okay, this is a uh, was kind of a revelation to me the extent of the uh, of the uh, bombs, uh, the bombs farm in in Bearden. Uh, it was all over to the uh, kind of west of of North Shore Drive there, uh, and they were famous for roses, but obviously they had uh, regal lilies uh, there as well. A beautiful um, field of those, and I believe Paul. There's one. Uh, is it? I can remember, Paul, whether this is the one that has something in the back. Oh, is that the, uh, Paul thinks that this is the most likely picture we have of, uh, of the old train station, um, that uh, Paul has done more triangulating and, and, uh, and there are only two known pictures of the train station that we've seen, both in kind of the kind of foggy background of, of pictures. Um, but uh, but that's, uh, that, that's, you know, plausibly one of them. All right, next one. All right, here's a here's a great picture of what people considered downtown uh, Bearden as it was uh, what about uh, 1945 or so. 
and you see La Hardy, everybody remembers La Hardy drugs. Uh, this is Kingston Pike looking uh, east uh, from roughly what North Shore is now. And uh, you see, see lots of stores that some people recognize along there, but the post office and lots of things were, were right along that little strip. Uh, later on, Bearden Center was built on the, on the left in the 1950s. We talked about the whole, in the book about the whole story about Bearden Center and, and, uh, and Kingston Center uh, built about the same time on the very similar designs. But uh, that, that's kind of what would greet people for, and you see all these, these, these filling stations, gas stations, and uh, and auto stores, people would drive. You know, like I said, be driving from Chicago to, to Miami, and would would see you know, places to stay, but also places to get get your car fixed, get a new tire. Uh, all these things were available. You could you could pretty much take care of anything in in Bearden in the in the 30s and 40s. Next one. All right, this is something that kind of blew my mind because I did not have I never heard anybody talk about this. Bearden had a tiny amusement park, uh, and it was right where, and you can tell it's right where, because Mayo's is in the background. Uh, Mayo's has not changed in 70 years. They literally, that, that, is, that is a historic building. That, is not, that, that was built in 1950 and has not changed a bit. Uh, but right across, diagonally across from Mayo's, it was now Everly Brothers Park, uh, was, a, was a, something called Kitty Land. And they had, uh, they had a, uh, uh, this is just a small part of it, but they had a, a, a giant electric train. They had uh, uh, things you could ride. They had um, you know, merry-go-rounds. They had a swimming pool. Uh, they claimed to be an Olympic, an Olympic size swimming pool. I don't know whether it was or not, but it was a, they had swimming lessons there. It lasted for only two or three years in the late fifties and early sixties. And, uh, and I don't know anybody locally that has any memory of, of, of this to speak of. Uh, and it's interesting that we, uh, got this indirectly through contacts on Facebook with a with a guy who had just who was from the Midwest or somewhere who just happened to be driving through Knoxville and had some of these pictures that he'd taken. Uh, he never lived here, just had these pictures that uh, that that connected with some of our our, uh, our 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 pals on Facebook, and we and we were able to to get permission to use this one. Uh, one of very few. Uh, I think only two or three pictures, uh, all from his collection of Kitty Land that I know of exist. Uh, but they had uh, they had birthday parties there. It was it was a fun place, and I I was maybe old enough to have gone there. And I, I have uh, been kind of uh, sharp with my mom about why didn't she ever take me there? She 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 doesn't remember it either. So, but it's a it's an interesting anomaly in, in beard and history. All right, I mentioned earlier a famous actress uh, came to town in 1970, uh, and this was kind of a, I, I'm not sure it's too much to make, to call this a, 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 a turning point uh, in a way that, uh, that uh, uh, Ingrid Bergman herself was here, uh, putting her, her handprint in, uh, in kind of our closest thing to a Hollywood Boulevard sort of thing. And that's the actual uh, stone that's still a concrete, piece of concrete that still exists over on Hamburg, Hamburg Drive. It's not exactly where, where it was when she put it, but not far either. Um, that looks kind of like John Ward in the background. I'm not sure whether it is or not, but, but anyway, this is a walk in the spring rain. She had shot this movie the year before in 1969 in the Knoxville area with uh, Anthony Quinn. Uh, a lot of people have seen the movie. Uh, it, it's, it has, has, has its moments. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd recommend it, even though Bruce Lee did the choreography of the the fight scenes uh, and in person in Cades Cove, but there are some scenes in the movie there they're recognizably Knoxville, including some up on top of uh, UT's hill. But she was here twice, wants to make a movie, and, and came back for the world premiere. And this is, I think, is significant in that in 1970, if this had been 10 years earlier, any kind of world premiere would have been downtown at the Tennessee Theater. But this, even five years earlier, they had a world premiere here with Tony and at the Tennessee with Tony Perkins. But this was 1970, and Bearden was the new exciting, the, the, the kind of changing, exciting new place. And that's where the Capri 70 was, which uh, uh, was a movie theater there that had evol evolved from the Pike Theater before it had been there since 1946. But it, it was bigger and fancier, and now was our first really cineplex in the area, even though it was just two theaters for many years. Uh, it was a it was an exciting place to see a to see a, a new movie, especially one that was shot 
here. Uh, so that I think it's kind of symbolically important that Ingrid Bergman got out of her car in uh, in 1970 and in, in in the middle of Bearden, and uh, and and planted her her, her handprint there and, and also signed it. There are some other uh, other because she did that. Uh, they they began anytime an actor was in town, they would try to get uh, get them over to uh, to uh, the Capri to 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 do the same thing. All right, next one. All right. Well, this is a, a shot of a of a, oh yeah. Th th this is the uh, the Quonset hut style. These are new buildings, but built with uh, kind of reflecting uh, the Bearden uh, Quonset huts. Quonset huts were uh, a, a style of architecture developed during the Second World War, uh, popularized especially by the army. They they were useful. They could they were portable. Uh, they were all over the place. And they were all in all over the place in Knoxville too, but there were a lot for whatever reason there were a lot more of them in the Bearden area uh, in the 1940s, and they even began building buildings that had these barrel roofs. Uh, the old Caz Walkers in Bearden has a barrel roof on it. If you look, you have to look kind of at, at the side to see it. Um, but uh, but these this kind of architectural style is something that is more common. You see it other places, but it's more common in Bearden. Than elsewhere, and some architects in in building new buildings have used the same th that same style as a reflection, just kind of in in homage to uh, in homage to to Bearden uh, and and in the fact that there are so many Quonset hut style buildings, including some actual Quonset huts in Bearden. And Bennett Galleries, by the way, is the old Capri Cinema uh, that uh, uh, that is a great art gallery today. Uh, one, I, probably the biggest art gallery in, in this, this region that I know of, um, but it's in the old Capri Cinema building, the, the same building uh, that, uh, that, that Ingrid Bergman visited to, to, to de debut her movie. All right, and this is very recent history, uh, the uh, Sacred Heart Cathedral, and we talk about how this came about. This, this is the cathedral, not just for Knoxville, but for all of East Tennessee, uh, the whole Old East Tennessee Diocese is, is represented by this, this giant uh, cathedral, an amazing place. And, and I recommend if you haven't been inside, take the next opportunity to, to, to see it. It's, a, it's a, a quite a, quite a, a monument. Um, uh, and, uh, and we talk about the, the history of Catholics in the Bearden area going back to the days when um, a, 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 a several nuns who worked at St. Mary's Hospital uh, moved into the old Fulton mansion on Lyons View in the, in the 40s, I believe. And, and later on, uh, uh, the Catholic Church founded the original uh, Sacred Heart Church, uh, but this was really something to make that church the cathedral as they did in just kind of recent years. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, it's a it's a big story with a lot of like I say a lot of uh, of disparate parts that that are not completely disconnected. They're all they all have something to, do, to say about Bearden as it is today and, and as it has been for the last two hundred years. So anyway, we've got the we've got the book out. It's it's for sale. We have it at our website and uh, and I understand tomorrow they'll have it at uh, at Union Ave Books. So uh, so have a look. Lots and lots of pictures in there. Um, we just showed about about uh, four percent of them I would say but uh, if there are any other questions or comments I uh, would uh, be happy to entertain them, entertain them now. I don't have any questions that are in the chat just yet but um, yeah please feel free to drop them in there or let yeah. us know. All right. Well, thank everybody for coming out and, and please stay in touch with us. I'm, I'm uh, on email all the time, uh, uh, jack at knoxhistoryproject.org. Um, and uh, just uh, if you have a question that you that you just want to ask me personally or something you want to let me know. Um, uh, and, and I hope this, uh, if this sells really well, uh, we'll be able to do a second edition. And if there are any corrections, we haven't got any corrections yet. So uh, I'm glad to say that. Uh, but. Uh, we were pretty careful with this book and, and talked to as many people as we could and, and looked at as many sources that we could find. So, um, but it's, uh, it, it's never, nothing's ever definitive. There's always, you could always write another book about, about beard and history without even, even covering the things we covered. But, um, but there's a, but it's a, a fascinating place. And I hope this kind of gives you a, the book kind of gives you a sense, a sense of it, maybe a more, a greater appreciation of this, 
of this place we drive by, we drive by every day. But, uh, all right, well, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you so much, Jack.